Walking on the beach, enjoying the sunshine, and swimming in the Gulf of Mexico are all activities that Floridians and visitors to the west coast of Florida treasure. But lurking out in the surf are harmful blooms of algae, known as Karenia brevis, or red tide. When red tide blooms develop, they become concentrated, and the toxins from the cells cause fish kills and trigger respiratory distress in humans, marine mammals, and seabirds. Learning more about red tide and how the blooms form, grow, and travel are challenging questions that researchers at University of South Florida's College of Marine Science are tackling from multiple angles. We're trying to see if, with that, we can try to understand where it comes from and where it goes. Uh, why does it start and why does it end? How long does it last and how big an area does it cover? So USF oceanography professor Frank mueller Carger works with satellite imagery, looking at the big picture of the size of the blooms, sharing that data with other scientists to collaborate in different aspects of the ongoing red tide research. It's not just looking at where it came from spatially, which mm -hmm. is what we do using satellite data. It's also understanding how it interacts with other organisms and how that organism specifically, given certain temperature or salinity or nutrients, may respond to the environment in a way that just blooms and takes over everything else. Red tide blooms have formed almost every year, typically between the months of August and December, but can occur any time. Intense blooms cause shell fishery closures in the Gulf, affect commercial fishing, and have a devastating impact on tourism. In 2012, a lingering outbreak along the coast from Pinellas to Charlotte County left widespread fish kills along the beaches of southwest Florida. If they're close to the beach, the waves breaking and so on, it suspends either the cells themselves or the toxins that break, uh, when the cells break up, the toxins themselves get suspended in the, uh, in the mist, in the aerosols, and they get washed ashore and people breathe this. So this, it can lead to irritations in the, in the respiratory system. Different types of satellites capture a sequence of images measuring ratios of reflecting blue and green light. Ocean color data provides researchers information about the quality of the water, but also detects the movement of the currents. But we can also see patterns in the deeper ocean. If there is currents or blooms or both uh, blooms associated with certain currents or river plumes that extend way, way offshore and whether there's changes with the seasons or uh, with a, a rainfall event, or are there long-term trends? So one of the things that we're, we're doing, because now we have all this data for nearly 20 years, is uh, trying to see if, uh, if there's long-term trends in some of these properties, like in water quality or in the temperature of the ocean or in some of the major current systems. mueller Carger explains that most blooms are a natural phenomenon and phytoplankton is beneficial, providing oxygen before they develop into harmful algae. I'd say half or more of the oxygen that we breathe today, right now, is produced every day by the phytoplankton in the ocean. So with the satellite imagery, if you see something that is peculiar, that looks like a bloom, then you can target the effort to go there and monitor in that region. Ineas Soto is studying the satellite imagery of the entire Gulf of Mexico, trying to spot the blooms to develop an early detection system. In 2011, we had a bloom that we initially observed from the satellite, and that's very important because once we see it in the satellite, that means that the bloom is already formed and it has a high concentration. Using images from NASA satellites, scientists can tell more about the development of these blooms than ever before. We saw a, a bloom form near the area of the Mayaca River. We can see this, this area here was confirmed as a, as a bloom, and that remained there for a few days, but then it started slowing there. That's the area again. You can see the bloom. And then a couple of days later, you can see as it gets close to the Charlotte Harbor, it got uh, really large. Once the harmful algal bloom is detected by satellite, officials from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Research Institute and Moat Marine Laboratory collect water samples. There's a huge shift that happens in the ocean, and we don't understand that shift of critters in the water very well. Barbara Kirkpatrick has been studying the human health effects of red tide at Moat Marine Laboratory in Sarasota. Researchers at Moat Marine explore biological properties of the cells, trying to gain a better understanding of the bloom's dynamics working closely with researchers from USF. Corinia brevis is phytoplankton. So it's kind of an interesting critter because it has characteristics of both 
an animal and a plant. The animal part of it is that it actually has a flagella, a tail, that allows it to swim. And Corinia brevis actually does, at, in daytime, actively swim up to the surface. And that's where the plant side kicks in because it's able to photosynthesize. So it takes sunlight and makes energy from it. Since 2000, Kirkpatrick and her team have been studying lifeguards at Sarasota area beaches, as well as people who have asthma, to determine how red tide affects them. What we found is that it was repeatable. The healthy people consistently suffered from eye tearing, nasal congestion, and runny nose. The people with asthma had both upper and lower respiratory symptoms with wheezing and shortness of breath. Those symptoms can linger for days. Now the messaging, especially for people who have asthma and other lung disease, is you really need to avoid days when you have a lot of toxins in the air. If you go out to the beach <coughs> and you get that characteristic dry tickle in your throat, you know, if you're a healthy individual, you probably just want to assess how willing you are to be uncomfortable because it's just irritating. In addition to studying red tides from above, scientists also look below the surface. The satellite imagery is a two-dimensional imagery. It's images of just the surface. To get that third dimension, we go beneath the water all the way down to the bottom and, and to the surface. Glider pilot Chad Lemke is a project engineer at the College of Marine Science. Gliders are autonomous robots that profile the water column from the bottom to the surface, the entire water column, collecting data along the way. The gliders are battery powered, always moving, and rely on buoyancy to dive up and down. But just alone, that would be straight up and down. If in addition to that, you tilt it and you add wings, then it can soar. In October of 2012, the gliders were deployed into the Gulf in order to gain a better understanding of the West Florida Shelf prior to any sign of red tide. We pulled the, the glider back in and then several weeks later, uh, a red tide was detected down in Charlotte Harbor, off of Charlotte Harbor. We redeployed with our partners at Moat Marine Labs uh, with their glider fleet. We deployed one, our glider, outside and north of the, the bloom and then transected around the bloom to get the entire full water column properties and then transected into the bloom, whereas Moat Marine went straight through the bloom the entire, the entire deployment. By combining these data sets, we have a much better understanding of exactly how the entire bloom initiated and evolved during that time period at least. USF Research Associate Jason Lenez compiles all of the data collected from different sources and inputs it into a mathematical representation or model to illustrate the movement of the bloom. By using models you can fill in the gaps both in time and in space and you know, also you can use it as a predictive tool in order to try to say what's going to happen in the future. To accurately predict red tide blooms, researchers need a comprehensive understanding of the development and the entire life cycle of the bloom. So our ultimate goal is to try to be able to provide forecasts, kind of like you would with a hurricane model, that will show when and where that bloom is going to go and at what intensity. Many questions remain about red tide, but the predictive forecasting USF scientists are developing will help residents and visitors continue to enjoy the treasures of Florida's west coast.